Es imposible, ha empezado el canal y no puedo dejar la visa. ¡Dispersado! ¡De prisa!
Hello and welcome to today's edition of The Domestic Church. Now, that was a scene from a film uh, made in 1959, but set uh, just before the Second World War, uh, in fact, during the Spanish Civil War, uh, of uh, a priest uh, who uh, began to offer Mass before shelling started and uh, continues to say Mass. You may uh, have noticed that um, the officer runs up to the server uh, and basically says to him, you know, we, we, we stop, we've got to stop the mass, uh, to which the server replies, no, it's not possible, not possible. <laughs> mass, mass has started, it must continue. And then what's particularly uh, moving, of course, is then to watch the consecration of the host and the chalice while all the bombing and shelling is going on around. And what's particularly uh Beautiful, I think, is uh, the consecration of the host when the priest elevates the host. Uh, and again, at the end, uh, when he genuflects um, after consecrating the chalice, uh, notice how the demeanor in the priest's face changes. Before the consecration, he looks full of trepidation. After the consecration, he looks calm <clears throat> and relaxed. And why? Because Jesus is here, because Jesus is present. And I played that film because I want to assure you all that irrespective of Traditionis custodes, irrespective of Pope Francis or any Pope, there will always be the traditional Latin Mass. There will always be faithful priests and bishops who will continue to celebrate and offer and to make the Mass of the Ages available. But the time, my brothers and sisters, has come now for those who would be faithful to be faithful. The time has now come for those who treasure the perennial traditional liturgy to make a stand and be counted and support it. As you all are now more than aware and probably sick of hearing about it, but this is too big uh, a situation to casually dismiss. Already, uh, other commentators are beginning, as it were, to downplay uh, the significance of what has occurred. And sadly, um, that is what happened before and which is why we are in this situation again now. When Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre made his stand, and when those few faithful uh, clergy and people made their stand just before he began the Society of St. Pius X, it was all downplayed. He was vilified, but of course now has been vindicated. And in those intervening 50 years, what happened? the Mass, the traditional Latin Mass, did not disappear. It continued. And here I would have to say that it continued, not just because of Archbishop Lefebvre, not just because of the Society of St. Pius X, but actually in part because of the old Romans and others who had already kind of made a stand, were kind of forced to make a stand for the traditional faith and liturgy years before and who continued indeed uh, for the old Romans uh, talks um, had begun uh, with the Vatican and then the Second Vatican Council happened and in many ways in many ways in some ways thank goodness it did 
because it meant that those talks discuss those discussions ceased there was no way that the old romans were going to ditch the traditional liturgy there was no way we were going to ditch the traditional faith and it was the old roman mass centers that continued and continued to offer the traditional latin mass before marcel lefebvre was finally persuaded in 1970 to begin and found the Society of St. Pius X. But of course, he came as a great champion um, and we are thankful, of course, to him that today the traditional Latin Mass is still with us, is still here and is never going to go away. The fact that the society, like us old Romans, was separated from the church. And notice in both cases, not by any action on our part, but rather by those in authority. But even so, we stuck by the faith. We stuck by the mass. So that today, of course, the traditional Latin Mass is in a much better situation than it was towards the end of the 1960s and the beginning of the 1970s. And for all the um, disagreements and for all the polemics, uh, the only reason why uh, the Fraternity of St. Peter, the Institute of Christ the King, Sovereign Priest, um, the Institute of the Good Shepherd, uh, the uh, St. John Vianney administration of Campos and all the other traditionalist congregations exist. It's because of the principal stand that Archbishop Lefebvre and others made. And one of the beautiful things, as it were, well, not beautiful, but one of the fortunate things, perhaps, is that because we were separated, we continued and it doesn't matter now what popes do or don't do what they say or don't say because we more than ever will continue to be faithful we more than ever will make sure the continuance and the availability of the traditional latin mass and not just of the mass but of the perennial Catholic faith as well. Now we've already discussed elsewhere the question of obedience. It doesn't apply. The question of obedience in this situation does not apply because holding fast to the traditional Latin mass and thus to the traditional faith means holding fast to God. So it doesn't matter what laws or canon laws uh, men may make up and introduce. Those who are faithful to God know what to do. Remember our Lenten motto, God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. And we've only to look at the histories uh, and the history of traditional Catholicism to see that despite all the odds, we're still here. <laughs> despite all the odds of our 168 years, the old Romans are still here. Despite all the odds, the Society of St. Pius X is still here. And look set to continue and are doing everything uh, we can. I can't speak for the Society of St. Pius X, but I can, I can only go by observation to see that they are absolutely 100% committed to ensure uh, that the mass of the ages continue to be available. There's no, no way they're stopping their ministry. And likewise, no one's going to stop the old Roman ministry, um, despite the various uh, machinations uh, of men 
and of dark angels for the past 168 years we're still here and so i'd like you to remember that film remember that consecration remember the fidelity the dedication and the commitment to jesus that priest and server displayed remember the faith and see how they were preserved see how they were protected and know that even if they had been hit they would have died with the promise of heaven with the expectation of heaven and with the hope of heaven and likewise as i say no matter what popes do no matter what laws are promulgated no matter what decrees are given there will always be faithful orthodox traditional catholics who will ensure the mass of the ages is always available but like i say we need your support you now need to make the commitment to make the dedication and what we can't uh, stand by is all the equivocation that now will suddenly come about as it has done over the years of those who will say oh well um uh, but we have to do what he says we 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 have to we have to hunker down uh we have to um comply no you don't have to comply and all that complying will do is perpetuate for another perhaps 50 years the sad situation and state of the church as it has been in recent years the time for compromising the time for negotiations perhaps even is over and again not for not because of us not because of any change in in our attitude or lack of charity uh, on our part but simply because read pope francis's own words he wants the traditional latin mass gone he has said as much quite clearly quite plainly in his letter to the bishops accompanying the motu proprio and understand my brothers and sisters that even if as rumors are already speculating uh, he may demise shortly it doesn't matter the next conclave is already stacked there is no new benedict the 16th there won't be a benedict the 17th coming there won't be a pius the 13th coming it's not going to happen because they're not in the conclave for sure there are some sympathetic cardinals but what has that sympathy done for the traditionalist movement what has it done for the traditional latin mass where are there where is their power they have none yes they're very good at speaking brave words their penmanship is 
brilliant. But where is their stand? Where is their banner? Where is their rallying cry? And the truth is, it won't happen. Just as it didn't happen with Cardinals Atoviani or Cardinal Siri or any of those other earlier on 50 years ago, those other sympathetic Cardinals. Yes, again, they spoke marvelous words. They penned incredible pamphlets. But they hankered down, they knuckled down, they compromised, they complied. And it's folly to think, my brothers and sisters, that now will be any different. I can tell you now that no one among them is brave enough to act like Archbishop Lefebvre did. Bishop Athanasius Schneider, he is not going to make a principal stand. He is not going to plant a banner and rally troops. And there will be, I'm sure, beautiful sounding, appreciable reasons and excuses as to why they won't. But it won't serve. It won't serve tradition. It won't serve the traditional Latin Mass. It doesn't matter that they might continue to say it in their private chapels or oratories. It doesn't matter that they might travel around the globe and offer it where it's been permitted. if they were going to make a real stand a real difference they would be petitioning now for this motor proprio or at least for the sentiments of it to be tabled for discussion at the upcoming vatican three i mean uh uh synod because until the Second Vatican Council is, is definitively interpreted until the theology of the contemporary Catholic Church and its liturgy is definitively interpreted and explained. Then there will always be this anxiety. There will always be this tension there will always be this friction because the new mass cannot be reconciled with the old and the contemporary theologies cannot be reconciled with the perennial tradition and faith of the church not without serious deliberate discussion which so far no one has called for and no one's prepared to have and why won't they call for it and why won't they have it because they know the distinction the difference will become obvious to everyone it will be exposed And it would require, it would require the greater number of prelates, bishops in the church, the hierarchy, either to eat humble pie, beat their chests of mea culpa, and conform to the true faith and learn the old liturgy or 
it will have to be accepted and admitted that in the 1960s a schism took place that a new church was created a new religion was founded or if they don't want to call it a new religion just accept that they embraced high church protestantism because that is effectively what the theology of the new form of mass is and in many ways that has been what uh, the prevailing theology of the contemporary magisterium has been how else is it possible to produce all these joint statements on theological questions with the thousands of different protestant denominations so it's very unlikely very unlikely that the that the serious discussion needed required will ever happen now of course there is always hope we may hope that eventually that discussion will be had we may hope that eventually more catholics and bishops particularly will realize the errors of the implementation at least of vatican ii will recognize the errors or the error that is the new mass but that could take years for sure there are lots of young orthodox men entering into the seminaries now and coming out of the seminaries now not for naught did pope francis put in that motu proprio that any priest ordained after the date of the issuance of that motu proprio would have to require license from his bishop via the vatican before he could offer the traditional latin mass think about that why 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 did he put that in because he wants to intimidate those young orthodox men he wants to intimidate them he basically wants to say to them apply if you dare apply if you dare to say the traditional latin mass of course that's one of the inherent contradictions within this motu proprio that on the one hand the bishops apparently have full authority and jurisdiction over the liturgy in their diocese but then on these points must refer to rome must refer to the vatican before as it were they can give their permission now i know bishop uh, paprocchi uh, Paprocchi or Paprocchi, I'm not quite sure, but forgive me, Excellency, I don't know how to pronounce your surname. Um, I know he has referred to Canon 87. Uh, many people are getting excited about Canon 87. What does Canon 87 say? It basically says that a bishop in his diocese can, as it were, suspend the application uh, of um, uh, a universal law uh, or custom within his diocese. So, in other words, um, the bishops if they wanted to they could invoke canon 87 and ignore the motu proprio now again that's perfectly uh, perfectly good stand to take canonically but do we think that rome is going to allow that to happen for how long will bishop aprocchi be allowed to keep observing canon 87 and applying it to the motu proprio has he not already probably had phone calls from the nuncio or from his eminence in 
Washington. I'm sure he's already being leaned upon. And as we've seen time and time again, like for ourselves as old Romans, like for Marcel Lefebvre and the Society St. Pius X, like the Franciscans of the Immaculate, like all the various cancelled priests, it doesn't matter actually if canon law is on your side. It doesn't matter that you can prove your case in canon law. If Rome doesn't want it, if Rome says no, that's it. It doesn't matter if Rome misapplies the canon laws. I mean, we really are. This is, this is in, a, in a crux situation. This really is a battle. And this is why I'm saying, don't be fooled. Don't be lulled into a full sense of security by those commentators who are now surfacing, who are beginning to equivocate. Those who are saying, oh, we'll, we'll just have to accept the motu proprio and work with it as best we can. Or even those like Bishop Abrocchi who are trying to make a stand. Unless all the bishops take a stand, it's not going to make any difference. Like I say, there's always hope. We can always hope that a new pope will come and will make it all right. And for sure, we should pray for that. But as I said in my homily yesterday for the Feast of St. Peter in Chains, is Peter in chains? Is tradition now confined, consigned, constricted? It really is the situation now where a stand needs to be taken. And that requires courage. And it requires sacrifice. It will mean even the faithful not compromising. It will mean constant petitions, letters, emails, articles, texts, videos, urging bishops to allow Latin Mass apostolates to continue. And where they won't, and where they crush them, it will be necessary to join the resistance, as it were. It will be necessary to affiliate yourself with traditionalists. And if that means pro tem, going to the independent chapels, to the society chapels, to old Roman mass centers, if it means going to hotel conference rooms for mass, if it means a return to the domestic church, going to Christians' homes for Mass, then so be it. Then that's what you must do. This really is, my brothers and sisters, a crisis. And what mustn't happen is what has allowed the last 50 years to occur this is not the time to equivocate this is not the time to compromise this is the time either to force things or to make a stand pope francis has thrown down a gauntlet Pope Francis quite clearly 
believes that to be a Catholic in the 21st century, one must believe everything that the Second Vatican Council concluded upon, that one must accept that the Novus Ordo Missae is the only expression of the Latin Rite, and one must accept all the other doctrinal errors of the last 50 years as well. He has made that clear, plain, in this motu proprio and in his letter accompanying it. There's no question about that. There's no doubt about that. And there is very little prospect of that changing. And even if it does change, even if, even if, for argument's sake, um, even if, for argument's sake, one of the top papabile, so one of the top um, contenders for the papacy next, is Cardinal Tagle, formerly Archbishop of, the, of Manila in the Philippines, now President of Caritas International, a hot favourite to succeed Francis. Let's just say that even Cardinal Tagle becomes Pope, and we know he's a very emotive man. You know, he, he can turn on the waterworks at a drop of a hat, um, so let's say that he has compassion for tradition. Let's say that he sees the hurt and the pain caused by Tradiciones Custodes, and he determines that he will revoke it. I mean, let's face it, that, that seems to be now the precedent, the way of things. Popes can undo what previous popes did. Never heard of before, but that's, that's the New Deal. So let's say Cardinal Tagle, as Pope, takes compassion on traditionalists, revokes the motu proprio, re-institutes uh, the privileges and freedoms of uh, Samorum Pontificum. Okay, the traditional Latin Mass would be free again, but all the ambiguity, all the tension, all the confusion and chaos will just then return and continue. The next Pope and any future Pope worth his off worthy of his office must, must have the discussion must enable and facilitate the discussion, must definitively interpret Vatican II and defend or get rid of the new mass. And the question, of course, will then be, let's say that the discussion is had. What if then a definitive interpretation of Vatican II is given? And many of the errors inherent in some of those documents are now defined with the full approbation of the magisterium. And let's say the new mass is then absolutely solemnly declared to be the only valid expression, legitimate expression, valid and legitimate expression of the Roman Catholic Mass, the Roman Catholic liturgy of the, of the Latin rite. Could such a thing happen? Well, effectually, it already has. Because this is the tension that we've all experienced and are experiencing now. And we can all see 
that there is no good fruit. So in a funny kind of way, we have to be careful what we wish for. But even if the discussion is had, even if a definitive interpretation of Second Vatican Council is given and it aligns with the contemporary magisterium, the spirit of the council, and if it defines that the Novus Ordo is the Mass, what's going to happen then? What's going to happen then? Will Cardinal Burke and Bishop Schneider and all the others, will they make a stand then? You see what I'm trying to say? What difference will it make? Until, until there is a traditional Pope. then there will always be this friction and this tension. There will always be this anxiety. And why? Because it will take a considerable effort for any bishop, even if he becomes Pope, to make that stand for tradition and so we're we're left in this as it were no man's land but but Christ's promise still holds true because the church is made up of the saints who are sinners striving after holiness who are the living stones yes ideally institutional church should be one and the same and recognizable as the church of Jesus Christ ideally But in the meantime, that doesn't mean that those who believe one holy Catholic and apostolic faith should comply or compromise. We are the church. For the church of Jesus Christ it's founded upon the confession that Jesus is the son of the living God. St. Peter's confession of faith and all those who hold to that confession make up the church. So now is not the time to lose heart, but now is the time for some serious thinking to take place. For those who would be faithful. Vote with your feet. Vote with your wallets. Give and support 
traditional Latin mass apostolates, whether officially recognized by Rome or not, doesn't matter. What matters is the faith. What matters is the mass. And trust in God. Trust in the promises of Christ. Trust that at some point in the future, it will be sorted out or it won't be. You know, for us old Romans, as I said, 168 years we've been in the wilderness. It doesn't bother us because we have the faith. We have the mass we know we're saved well of course we're working out our salvation but we're pretty sure that god's grace is afforded us and likewise for the society of pious attendants and all the other traditional catholics you know people mock the sede vacantis because they say oh well you know it's been 70 years according to you without a pope so you know, how's it going to ever be sorted? And the Senate of Cantus will say to you, well, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. But it will be. And understand that, you know, the situation, the position, as it were, of the society and of old Romans and others is not necessarily the same as that of the Senate of Cantus. We're not saying that there is no Pope. But we are saying, and we have to admit this, some of us even to ourselves, we are saying that the Pope is in error. The papacy is in error. The contemporary magisterium is in error. And until those errors are addressed, then we are always going to be in this situation. Now, apparently some some are uh, uh, wondering about my collar today um well if you've ever seen my full name uh spelled out uh formally then you will have noticed that at the end uh there is an acronym osjv which means uh oratory well, the oratory of saint john Vianney, which is the congregation i belong to so as oratorians oratorians traditionally wear um a collar like this um so i'm as it were uh in habit today <laughs> um bishops uh or uh or members of uh religious orders or congregations etc that become bishops um uh, as it were are automatically dispensed um not from any vows, of course, that they've taken, um, but are generally dispensed, for example, from wearing the habit in order that they may wear um, uh, the Episcopal um, uh, habit, as it were. Um, so um, that's why, you know, perhaps more often than not, you've seen me in the more conventional Roman collar. Um, which is slightly ironic because originally this was the Roman collar in the <laughs> in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, this effectively was uh, the Roman collar, which is why the oratorians, for example, the, the oratorians of uh, St. Philip Neri, um, that's why they uh, traditionally wear uh, a sort of collar similar to this. Others of you may have seen Father Gregory Hess uh, also used to wear a collar like this because it was sort of the common collar for... Um, uh, clerics uh, in the uh, 16th and 17th uh, and even 18th centuries. Um, the Roman collar, as we now know it, uh, is a later 19th century um, phenomenon. 
Um, and I have to say that um, it is very comfortable. This is slightly more comfortable uh, than the conventional uh, Roman collar, uh, which is in part uh, why I'm wearing uh, why I'm wearing it today. But as it were, today for me was a kind of dies non. A dies non uh, means literally translated means a non day, uh, which kind of basically means a kind of off day or a day off. Um, so, as it were, uh, having a a, a dies non earlier today. So for part of the day, um, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go casual. <laughs> so, so, so if, if, if you like, this is, uh, this is me in, in casual, uh, <laughs> casual dress or casual attire. <laughs> um, okay. Well, that's really all that I wanted to say uh, today, not about the collar, but about uh, the situation in the church, because I don't know about you, but I'm kind of tired of it all. Tired of, you know, having the same conversations, you know, what, what sort of gets me. On the one hand, I appreciate that um, more now are aware than previously um but it does you know I, I do find it a little bit irksome sometimes hearing contemporary commentators um speaking as if for the first time on subjects and issues and points of doctrine and liturgy that you know some of us have known forever um but at the same time it's good it's good as it were that more people uh, are now educated and exposed uh, to the truth um, but I do want you to understand that it's not just about truth as in um, an ideological concept or philosophy but it's actually about reality the reality of the situation today is this that the new mass and the new doctrines are not consistent with the perennial magisterium of the church. They're not a continuation of the Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi of the church. And as I say, some of us have known this for a long time. Some are only now beginning to become aware. And I get that because in part, um, the enemy has been very clever in manipulating and obfuscating and obscuring facts. And this, of course, became self-evident in the motu proprio and Pope Francis's accompanying letter, where he, he misstates facts, historical facts, for example, like his reference to St. Pius V. I'm not going to repeat that again because it's ad nauseum, but, you know, he misstates fact. He deliberately spins it to suit his own agenda, to suit his own thinking. This supposedly the successor of Peter Yes, he is the successor of Peter. Well, I'm not, I'm not equivocating over that. But is this a good shepherd? Does a good shepherd deliberately misrepresent facts? And, you know, we see this, this is a tactic of progressives and modernists. They have no shame in lying, staring you in the face and lying to suit their cause. And, and as dear brother Stanislas, uh, who some of you will know from Unscripted and from now his own show on Fridays on this channel, as he said, for years 
um, he was hoodwinked, as everyone was hoodwinked into thinking, into believing that the new mass was a slight variation of the old mass. It's not that the theology of the new mass is, you know, just a continuance of what was believed before. It's not. It's utterly different, totally different. You can use, as they do, traditional terminology to explain supposedly the new mass. All they're doing actually is telling you what we believed for centuries, but which the new mass does not itself convey. But anyway, I don't want to... Um, belabor the point as it were what I did and most specifically want you to go away with is the knowledge that and the assurance that and the hope that just like that priest in the Spanish Civil War that we saw at the beginning of this program just as he faithfully persisted with offering the mass despite the bombs and the shells going off around him and just as he was able to find hope and relax at the consecration so too my brothers and sisters support traditionalists support the traditional latin mass apostolates we're not going anywhere support the society support the old romans we're not going anywhere we as it were that priest is a figure of us for the society of the last 50 years for old romans of the last 168 years we're not going anywhere we will not give up the mass we will not give up the faith no matter what any pope says no matter what any pope does because we seek and desire only to be faithful to jesus christ in nomine patri et filii spiritus sancti amen Dominus obiscum, et cum spiritu tuo. Te nomen Domini benedictum, ex hoc nunca tusque in secula, auditorium nostrum in nomine Domini, qui feci celum et teram. Benedictio Dei omnipotentis, Patri, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, descende super vos, et mane et semper. Amen. Remember, God is faithful to those who are faithful to him.
Old Roman TV, needs your help. So that as many people as possible can find us. We need you to share, like, tweet, and emote, every episode you watch. We need everybody to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that we can monetize it. Subscribing to the ORTV YouTube channel means you can re-watch your favorite or missed episodes whenever you like. But to really help us, we need regular financial support to enable us both to sustain and to improve our programs. Becoming a patron means not just receiving great merch, but also other privileged benefits like advanced viewings, premieres, sponsor surveys, unique interviews, and many other benefits, including a regular mass intention. Old Roman TV. Presenting the same thing. Today. As yesterday. For tomorrow.